All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go ahead and kick off today's um, webinar and educational class on the advantages of investing in private notes. Uh, my name is Jason DeBono, Vice President of Newview Trust Company. Uh, I've been with the company for 15 years, uh, and I've seen a lot of different investments, but this one is a little bit more near and dear to me, as this is something that I've actively done with my own retirement accounts uh, for many, many years. And so uh, today I'll talk a little bit about kind of what we see and how these work. And I'll talk a little bit about maybe some of the things that I've done uh, along the way that have allowed me to get out and invest into some private notes. And I will tell you, uh, as, as uh, cliche as it sounds, if I can do this, certainly anybody uh, can get out and do that. So without further ado, uh, we will go ahead and get started. Um, Hold on one second. Sorry, let me make sure I can click the slides. There we go. Um, so the first thing I want to make sure everyone understands that a lot of times people ask us, what does new you do? And it's actually ironic. It's easier to tell people what we do by telling you what we don't do. So we are not advisors. We're not CPAs. We're not attorneys, right? We do not endorse or approve investments. We're not a fiduciary. Everything that we do and educate you on is not to provide you advice or recommendations, it's to educate you on what's out there. We are custodians of retirement accounts. We are passive in our role, uh, and we do not, will not, and cannot uh, in any way recommend, approve, or endorse investments. So we're smart in terms of knowing our business. We've been doing this uh, since 2003. We've helped you know, over probably 15,000 clients over the years self-direct. Uh, we currently custody almost one and a half billion dollars uh, of assets, but we do all of that as a passive custodian. So Newview's role is to allow investors like you to go out and make their own choices with their retirement money. So if your desire is for someone to tell you what to buy or when to buy and when to sell, um, you're not gonna find that at Newview. What you will find at Newview is the ability to go out and self-direct your retirement account into what you see fit without the constraints of being tied to just stock sponsor mutual funds. And we're going to talk today specifically about private notes, but for the first couple slides, we'll generalize a little bit uh, in true self-direction. I think this slide goes without saying, but I always like to start with it, and that is that Americans simply don't save. Um, and a lot of you may be thinking, well, why are we talking about savings? I'm here to, to, to learn how to invest in notes. And I always like to make sure people understand that it's really two different concepts here. Retirement planning is about saving and then investing that money for the greatest return, right? Saving and then investing that money for the greatest return. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But the reality is, as you can see, very few people are saving. Uh, over 50% uh, of those under the age of 30 even have savings. But a number, if you get up here, um, when you get to this 60 plus years old with 15% that don't even have savings. Um, so the numbers are still bleak. Don't fall into that category. Be a good saver, right? So when you save, what does it really mean, right? And there's a lot of different ways to save, right? If I have a dollar that I want to put away, I can put it in my mattress, right? Now, the drawback to that is that dollar is actually losing money. It's losing money because inflation is growing faster than the money's growing. So if I take that dollar out 10 years from now, yes, I have a dollar, but that dollar may not buy me a loaf of bread like it may buy me today, right? It may cost me two of those dollars or three of those dollars. So I have to be aware that if I save in a vehicle like burying it in the backyard or some non-interest bearing account, I'm really losing money because my purchasing power is actually getting smaller as time goes on and my money is staying the same. The second alternative that I have is to go take that money and put it into some sort of savings or investment vehicle. But if I do that with my personal money, it's taxable. So if I take that dollar and I go out and put it into the stock market and it grows to $2, Right? If I did that in my personal name without setting it up in any tax advantage vehicle, that, that dollar that I earned is taxable to me. Right? Still a good thing. I made a dollar. I may have had to pay 25 cents of that in tax, but I still made a dollar. I also have the ability to put that same dollar into a retirement account or some sort of tax advantage vehicle. And that compound growth provides major dividends because if I take that dollar and it doubles to $2 and I did it inside a retirement account, I don't have to pay tax on that. I'm either deferring it 
or in the case of a Roth, eliminating it. So I'm going to highlight the difference between, we're not talking about the investment side of what we're doing yet. We're talking about simply where do we save in the benefit of saving and investing wisely inside an IRA. So if I were to take a dollar, similar example that I've already started and double it, and I do that over the course of 20 time periods, so we'll call that 20 years. If I take that dollar and I double it at a 25% tax, I will have $72,570 when I'm all done. So let me give you an example of how we get to that number. I take a dollar, right? I double it, I now have $2. That's $1 of earnings taxed at 25%. I now have $1.75 to reinvest. I take $1.75, I reinvest it, it doubles to $3.50. I take this $3.50, I pay 25% and so on and so forth. So what you have is you're going up, giving a little back, and then going up, giving a little back, and going up, right? And at the end of all of that, I could turn a dollar in 20 compounding periods by doubling it into $72,500. Pretty good, right? I shouldn't say pretty good, really good. I think everybody would love to do that. Now, what's, what I love about examples like this is that you can add as many zeros as you want. So if you wanted to start with $10, you'd add $720,000. If you started with $100, you'd add $7.2 million, right? It helps underscore the value of saving. So that same investor doubling their money every year, right, which we know is certainly unrealistic, but the same investor, if one person started with $10, one person started with $1, and one person started with $100, the person with $100 would have $7.2 million compared to seventy-two or $720,000. Significant difference because one was a better saver, not because one was a better investor, right? So kind of lesson number one to, to learn on, on today's webinar is that sometimes being a better saver can actually get you further along than being a better investor. But being both is what's best. Now we're going to take this example, and I'm going to ask you to just think through this and, and uh, ask yourself, how much money would I have if I didn't have to pay that 25% tax on my earnings? So when I made a dollar, instead of paying a quarter and only having 75 cents plus my original dollar to reinvest, I would have had the dollar plus my original dollar or $2. So ask yourself what you think that would be worth. What's this tax really costing you over the long term? And I think you'll be incredibly surprised to see the answer. Now I'll pause there while you're thinking about it, and yelling at you, maybe your computer screen or your phone, as to what you think the number is. Um, and I apologize for not mentioning this sooner. Um, as you can see here, I have a little bar on my screen um, that tells me who's on, and if you have questions, um, you can ask those. There are two places that you can type those in. One is the Q&A section, um, right? You can, can enter that. And then there's also a chat function, and you can type them in the chat. Either way, those will pop up. So please, I apologize for not mentioning that sooner. If you do have questions, get those asked um, as we go, uh, and I want to make sure that I address that. So now back to our doubling example, right? I took a dollar, I doubled it at 25% tax, I have $72,570. By putting that money into an IRA first, the dollar, making all the investments the same way and not being subject to tax, you end up with $1,048,000. So over 12 times the money, not because you were a better saver, because you both only saved a dollar, not because you were a better investor, because you both invested to double it annually, right? But simply because you understood the value of a compound growth account versus the value or potential loss of value of a taxable account. The beauty of this and I'll talk through this as we continue to go, is that this, even if I defer taxes, meaning I do it in a non-Roth account, this number is 1,048 taxed once. So even if you were to tax this money in the 35% or 37%, right, our highest tax brackets today, you would still have over $600,000. That's after tax net of nearly nine times the money because you're paying it as you go and reinvesting less, and you're actually paying it at the end and reinvesting more. What's amazing in this process 
is that if you actually were to take this number and compare the tax revenue, this number actually makes, right, makes more tax revenue than that example, but this number is significantly bigger. So even after tax, we're talking about a much bigger uh, pie here. So the moral of this is very simple. Number one, save and be a good saver. Number two, make sure you're saving and investing in the best vehicles because the same saver and the same investor can only get so far. What third element inside of that of being a good saver and a good investor is understanding tax strategies to keep more of what you make. And self-direction is all about a tax strategy to keep more of what you make. So when we go through this process, we talk about what you can invest and what you can do. Let's start by talking about what type of accounts exist. So as far as custodian and as far as private notes go, you can self-direct your account as discussed into private notes if you have a traditional, a raw, a SEP, a simple, even an HSA, an ESA, and a solo 401k. So we put these on here to give you an idea of the numbers. This is not a presentation to tell you um, about all the different account types, but I'm here to make sure you, you understand all of these accounts can be self-directed. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about how I invest, and we'll talk about private notes, because I have my 401k through NewView, which is self-directed. I have an HSA account for my, tied to my high deductible health insurance plan. And for my eight-year-old, right, we've set up an educational savings account. I have bought and sold notes, originated, bought, and sold notes over the last 15 years, right, through all three of those accounts. And in a lot of cases, same note split up into all three of those accounts. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So looking at this slide, this is your takeaway. If you have retirement dollars, including HSAs and ESAs or solo 401ks, all of those generally are eligible to invest into non-standard or non-public investments, like notes, because these aren't publicly sold. And furthermore, you can combine different accounts to complete the purchase of one note. So if you're sitting here thinking, I really want to invest, or I really want to buy into notes, or I really want to go loan money, but I've only got $21,000, and I don't know anyone that needs 21. I know people that need 40 or 50. Well, you may know other people. You may have a spouse, a friend, a family member, or you may even have other accounts that you didn't know could all be combined to write one loan, divided up between the accounts to get that 50 or 60,000 or 100 or 200 or whatever the number is that people may be looking for. So what can you do with these accounts? Well, self-direction, right? There's mortgages and notes. That's what we're going to talk about today. But as we go around this, this real estate, private stock, partnerships, debentures, LLCs, precious metals, the list is pretty infinite in terms of what you're capable of investing your retirement dollars into. So what are the rules? Very simple. You cannot buy life insurance or collectibles. Well, obviously, notes is not an issue, right? Notes and real estate and all those things we mentioned are not listed. They're not considered prohibited by the IRS. You can see the list is very short. The second rule that you got to follow is who does the IRA do business with? And that's the area that you want to make sure you always maintain an arm's length. Based on that example, right, of $72,000 versus over a million, you can see how powerful the tax benefits that are afforded are. And the IRS says, we need to make sure that people transacting inside that tax advantaged account are really investing solely for investment purposes in an arm's length. That's all. So you, the IRS says, you cannot do business with yourself. So your IRA can't loan you money, which makes sense, right? You could either pay it back at a real high rate or pay it back at a real low rate. Either way, the IRS says it would be too easy for you to get in money in and out of your account. Close family members, right? This includes your parents and grandparents, your children and grandchildren, and the spouses of all those parties. So your IRA cannot write a loan to your mom, your dad, your grandma, your grandpa. You cannot write a loan to a son, a daughter, a grandchild. Because again, the IRS says the lineage there is too close to the flame. We don't believe that the tax benefits and tax value will be intact too much opportunity to do something wrong. So they say it's expressly prohibited, right? And then lastly is certain business relationships. 
So by extension, if I can't loan money to, to my father through my IRA, I couldn't loan money to, to my father's business, right? That business interest by extension would be disqualified. Um, if you go onto our website, we have um, recorded plenty of things on prohibited transactions that explain it in better detail. But we want to make sure before we talk about all the value of notes, if your intention today is to figure out how to loan money to your family or to businesses you own or operate, that's not what an IRA is designed for. It, it has to be a strictly passive investment with unrelated parties. Right? So why invest in private notes? Well, I'm sure you guys have heard this saying, he who has the gold makes the rules. Now ask yourself, depending on no matter where you live, whether you live in a big city or not, if you've been dri driven through, flown into, and big into any big city, and you look at their skyline, what is the one thing that you notice that's similar in every skyline? That is that the number one type of company that has all their names on all the big buildings is who? Banks, right? It's banks. And he who has the gold makes the rules. And the beauty is you have gold. It doesn't matter how much you have, it's gold to somebody else. And that's why private notes make so much sense in the right scenario and can provide so much opportunity. So what are the benefits of private notes? Well, really, there's two ways to access them. And there may be a lot more, but I, I view notes as two different ways to get into them. Number one is you can set your terms. And number two is you can buy your terms. And really, the difference between that is when you set your terms, that means you're the originator, you're the lender, you're the one that actually is saying, if you want X dollars, here's the criteria that must be met, right? And what are some of those terms? Loan amount, the borrower, interest rate, points, fees, payment terms, collateral, all of those things get to be defined. It's the thing I love about private lending. No other investment offers this, none. I get to decide who I lend to, how much I lend, what terms they pay, what the payment terms are, and I get to determine what happens if they don't pay. Now, if I look at every other investment, when I give my money to a stock, I have no voting power, no say, no nothing. I simply have to believe enough in the management and operational efficiency of that company and the demand for the product that it will go up over time. I have no, 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 predetermined idea of how much I'm going to make over what terms. So I have to buy and sell and buy and sell, right, when it makes sense. Well, I think we'd all agree, especially looking at the market today, if you invested, you know, all of your money, sold everything you owned and bought every possible stock in 2012, you look like a genius. But who has the ability to do that? Not even these so-called gurus do that and get it right. If I look at real estate, and I love real estate, but I don't get to know what my terms are. I don't know how long I have to hold it. I don't know when I'm getting my money out of it. I don't have someone that's agreeing to pay, right? If I have a tenant that's agreeing to pay, they tend to be in one year tranches. I still have the property. My money is still tied up. So nothing can offer you the same bit of flexibility as the investor with all the upside that a private loan can provide you. The other way is to go buy the terms. I've done this quite a bit. If I don't want to go find a borrower and vet out the deal and underwrite it and determine all of that, I can go find someone that already has, and I can go buy that note. Now, I could buy that note because it's in trouble, right? Now, obviously, if I'm buying it because it's in trouble, then I'm buying it for better terms, right? I shouldn't be buying it if I didn't think there was some upside value if it was in trouble. But it may very well be a perfectly good note, and I can simply go buy that payment stream. And the beauty is I still get to buy the terms. Because if I go to buy a loan from someone and it's a second position and I don't want to be in a second position, I don't have to buy it. I get to buy under my terms, right? And everybody should have a different parameter of what terms look like. And when I first started writing loans 15 years ago, the terms are much different than they are today. In some ways, favorably, and in other ways, less favorably. But I have to move with the market. So my interest rate that I can charge today probably isn't as high as what I could charge before. But I also have property, right? And I have a, a, a base of people that can borrow that can put money into it. 
So maybe my loan to value has gone down or the quality of collateral has gone up. These are all different things, but the beauty is I get to make those decisions. And if a loan fits into my parameters, I choose to write it. If it doesn't, I pass. And that's a really cool way to invest. So whether you want to write your loans or whether you want to go have someone write them and you buy them from them, all of those options exist. Collateral. Now, I want to start by saying the IRS does not require that, that a loan inside an IRA be secure. Not required. New view does not require it because the rules don't require it. So we don't have any extra requirement. However, the value of a secured note is significantly higher than an unsecured note. Because what makes notes so powerful is the fact that if there is no payment made under the terms, I have an option. And I would challenge you while I sip of water here to think of any investment that if someone doesn't behave the way that you want them to, you get to take something. There's very, very little investment opportunity where you have that. So collateral should be something that can be held in an IRA if you need to foreclose. If it cannot be, so for example, if it's life insurance, right, you would need to have provisions to liquidate prior. It needs to be something of value. The whole point of collateral is it needs to mean enough to the person that offered it as collateral where they would behave differently to ensure the payments are made to not lose whatever that is. We've seen loans secured by just about everything you could ever imagine under the sun. Most commonly, and almost every loan I've ever done is secured by real estate. Okay. Secured by real estate. But you can secure loans by real estate. You can secure loans by cars and boats and watches and jewelry. Again, if you're going to secure it by something that cannot be held in an IRA, then you have to sell the note prior to foreclosing. So you, because you can't foreclose on a piece of jewelry, which is ineligible to be held in an IRA. But you could write a note secured by a Rolex watch, and in the event it went into default, you could sell the paper for the value of the Rolex watch. And then the person you sell it to would then foreclose, if you will. Okay? So you have lots and lots of flexibility. For simplicity, we're going to talk about real estate-backed loans because it's easier. You can swap real estate out with whatever you want, but I also want to share some insight and things to be aware of from a real estate standpoint. But when it comes to collateral, there is nothing better than being able to take something when someone doesn't do what they said they would do. And that is by far one of the best um, opportunities that exist from an investment standpoint. Um, I'm going to pause here. I've got a couple questions that have come in. All right, so the first one I think was suggesting there may have, it says 25% tax on $2 is 50 cents. So uh, in that slide, the, the earnings wasn't $2. Um, and I, I don't want to slow us down, but uh, when they reinvested, they reinvested $1.75. So their earnings were only $1.75, um, which is, is uh, why it was different. Um, have you had to enact non-payment terms for your own investments at some point, um, regardless what legal expense? So I'll touch on that. Um, great question. I'll kind of re restate it. Basically, what happens if you have to foreclose? So there's a lot of it really, first of all, what sort of legal action you take depends on the investment, right? Depends on what your documents say. So in most traditional foreclosures, you go through the foreclosure process, and that's a pretty standard process. Some cases it can be you can sue the individual right away, um, and that may get you some of your money back. Um, and so when I say sue, it could just simply be demand letters, threats of lawsuits, threats of foreclosure. Um, that tends to help. I have to say, in 15 years of writing loans, and I've probably written, I've probably written about six to eight myself, and I've probably invested in 10 to 15. Um, I have never had to foreclose. Um, and I won't suggest. There's a saying in in the lending world that if you aren't foreclosing on some of the deals you do, you're not aggressive enough. And there may be some truth to that. Um, I don't invest into anything that's not a first position, and I don't invest into anything with less than a 70% loan to value. So if, if, if somebody wants something and there's only 5% equity in the property, it's just not a loan for me. So 
what I've learned over the years, and really, to, I started in 2005, and 2007 and 8 taught us all a lot, but it taught me something sitting on the, the, the side of seeing my own investments and lots of other investments. People don't walk away from zero. Sorry. People don't walk away when they have more than zero in a deal. And I think what caused the 2007, 8, 5, whenever you want to earmark the real crash, but what caused that recession and what caused real estate especially to be dumped over the the, the walls was nobody had anything in real estate. You could buy real estate with zero money. And so there was no value or equity in the property. And so when push came to shove and properties dropped 15, 20, 30, 40%, people looked and said, well, let's see, I have no, nothing in this. If somebody puts 10 or 20% of their own money into a deal, even if they don't do it day one, but they do over time, you don't walk away from that. Right. So foreclosure is something that may happen um, as far as what expenses are entailed in that. Uh, it really depends on the deal. Uh, there's some other structures you can utilize like land trust that may allow you to simplify the foreclosure process. You need to talk to good, competent legal counsel about what that looks like. I know we've used that strategy in the past. Um, we've never had to deploy it, nor did we ever have to have a challenge, but all things to be aware of. Um, but part of that expense is recouped as part of the expense of the judgment at the end of all of this. So if you're writing loans against really good collateral, then the cost to foreclose should be offset by the collateral received. Okay? And that has to do with making sure that you're writing loans that fit the type of loans you want. <laughs> and remember, collateral is risk adjusted, right? It's risk adjusted. So somebody's not gonna pay 15% interest and put a $5 million property on collateral on a $50,000 loan, right? But they're not going to over collateralize a high interest rate loan. So you have to find that balance between better collateral typically means lower interest, right? Because they know that they have a lot more to offer to you or anyone else that wants to write that loan. Let me make sure. I don't know if these are additional questions coming in. Same ones. All right. So what are the responsibilities if you're going to be a lender? Now, remember, even if you buy a note, so whether you originate the loan or you buy it, because either way, it's a note is a note, there's still some things that you want to make sure that you're responsible for. <laughs> so one is make sure that you have good legal documents. Now, if you originate the loan, you've got to create them. If you buy the note, you got to review them. Either way, make sure that the legal documents under that note are covering the things that you may think you need to cover. Make sure you have all the appropriate copies signed by the appropriate parties, because in the event of default, right, you don't want to have any, you don't want to lose the ability to foreclose because you didn't cross a T or dot an I. <clears throat> I've had people tell me that, you know, well, I just downloaded a note off the internet. There's another saying, if you can't afford the attorney, you can't afford the deal. And I'm a firm believer in that, in the lending side. Get a good, competent attorney to draw this agreement up. Because if things go bad, which is not what you plan for, but you prepare for, if things go bad, that document is the only thing that's going to tell the story of who does what. And if it's poorly drawn up, you may not recuperate what you thought you could recuperate, right? Something that we always suggest, so any fees, including new view fees, if you're going to write this loan in your IRA and incur a fee from new view, or there's a lender fee, right? Meaning your attorney is going to charge a fee. Whatever that is should all be passed on to the borrower. So think about if you go buy a house personally, there's a whole lot of lines on that title, um, that HUD statement that, that say in the settlement statement, you know, um, loan fee, $795. Well, what do you think they're doing? They're passing on their fees to you as well. Remember, he who has the gold makes the rules. Um, make sure your payments are made. This seems so simple, but it's your responsibility. It's not a set it and forget it. If you have a loan and somebody is supposed to write you a check every month for that loan, go online and make sure it's been paid. Now, we'll email you when you get it, but go online. If you don't see the payment, reach out to the borrower. I've had clients that have said, oh, I didn't realize they weren't paying me. 
Okay, well, who did you think was servicing it? Right? You are the client. You are the one that's taking ownership. Until you assign that or offload that to someone else, you manage that process. Um, initiate late notices and collection notices when required. Your IRA will pay for any of that, but you need to take the first step. The time to foreclose and the time to collect and send notices is as soon as payments are missed. As soon as they don't follow the terms, make sure that they understand they're not following the terms. If you wait a few months or you, you accept every sob story as to why those payments can't be made, you will find yourself with an asset that's getting worse and worse by the day, and you're not any more likely to collect on that. And you'll hear me talk a little bit more about that. Um, foreclose as required. Your IRA pays any expense. So if you've got to go pay an attorney a thousand bucks to go through the foreclosure process, your IRA will pay that. So don't be scared to start foreclosure. It's not what you intended on, it's not why you wrote the loan, but that's the beauty. You have someone that's not following the terms and you have recourse. No other investment gives you that, but don't sit on the sidelines while that recourse may not get better, it may get worse. So make sure that you're, you're foreclosing as, as needed. Um, and then make sure we're up to date, because we don't know, right? We don't know. So if there's things that you're doing in the background, make, just make sure you communicate that with us, all right? Oops, sorry, let me go back. All right, so this is a list of things that, that I have seen. Some of this, I will be honest, I've taken in classes or things I've attended. Um, some of this is stuff I've seen from new views angle, whereby a client's run into an issue. And some of these are things I've had to deal with personally and learn, right? And the, the, the good and bad news about, about experience is we sometimes get the lesson after. So these are things that hopefully you get the lesson before the experience because they can be costly in the long run. Number one, don't loan if you don't want to own. Whatever it is that you are going to collateralize this loan with, assume you're going to own it. And if you're not happy with that outcome, it's not the right type of loan for you. When I first started doing loans, my dad used to participate in a lot of these loans right alongside. Right? I didn't have enough money in my account, so my account plus maybe my HSA plus my dad's IRA, we'd go right alone. And the reason that's permissible is we weren't loaning money to each other. We were writing one loan, slicing up the loan equally between the accounts based on the amount of money that we brought to the table. But my dad would always say, uh, whatever you think, if it's a good loan, I'm good with it. And I would always say, before you, before I accept it, right, meaning before I will put your IRA into this deal, dad, I'm going to send you the property, I'm going to send you the terms, I'm going to send you the amount that you're investing, and I want you to make sure that would you buy this property for that price, give or take a few thousand bucks. If you would, then you're protected. If you wouldn't, then that's not really collateral. Because if I'm going to write a hundred thousand dollar loan on a property I would never buy myself for a hundred grand, why do I want to have the risk of taking it on in the event they default? It just doesn't make sense. So do not loan if you don't want to own. Number two, this one's especially important in a lot of the loans that we see are a lot of rehab loans or repair loans. Um, it's because they come in smaller dollar amounts. They fit nicely into IRAs. The problem with them is the value is really repair-based, and you've got to be very careful here. So I'll give an example. If I'm going to write a, a loan for, let's just say, $150,000, and 100 of it is to acquire the property and 50000 is for rehab, I am not going to write the loan for one hundred and fifty dollars and give the borrower $150,000. Because the property is only worth a hundred till it's fixed up, and that's fifty thousand dollars that's out of my hands and in the hands of the borrower. Where if they don't put the money into the house, and I have to foreclose, I'm owed one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and I'm going after a property that's in disrepair. Right? It's not where it should be. So anytime there's repair money, I always write, give them after. It tells a couple things. Number one. It ensures that your value that you're looking at of the property is not defined by whether or not the work was done. And number two, it forces your, your, your borrowers to put some skin in the game. 
So you want to put a new kitchen in that costs 20 grand? Go put the kitchen in and I'll reimburse you the 20 grand. Or go put part of the kitchen in, I'll give you 10 grand. Do the rest, I'll give you 20 grand. So there's ways to ensure that the work is getting done prior to the money being delivered, right? And that's something that, you know, if, if you're going to be writing loans against projects that do have repairs, I strongly encourage. Don't loan unless you're willing to foreclose. Now, you may say, Jason, that's exactly what you said in bullet number one. Don't loan if you don't want to own. This is much different. Want to own means if you have to foreclose, you'll be happy with the collateral. That's number one. This says if you won't foreclose, don't write the loan. I get a call, it's probably five or uh, yeah, maybe five, seven uh, uh, years ago. And a client said, I've got a loan in my account and payments aren't being made. I said, okay, you know, and I'm, I'm curious what to do. And I said, well, first of all, you know, I'm not your financial advisor. You know, that's not the role we serve. However, um, I can tell you that, in, you know, what kind of loan is it? If it's got collateral, you reserve the right to foreclose, assuming that whatever terms have been violated. And he said, but I don't want to have to foreclose. I said, you know, well, I don't know what other options you would have. He said, well, the person I loaned the money to was the best man at my wedding. There's a prime example of don't loan if you're not willing to foreclose. If you can't write a financial agreement between someone that you're friends with that's not disqualified that you are both going to adhere to, don't do it. There's nothing wrong with that to say, hey, I don't want this loan to come between our friendship. This client went a few years without doing anything about it. It was as the, the values of everything were sinking, borrower completely stopped paying. And when they finally got to the point where they realized their friendship was already ruined as a result and they did foreclose, there was very little left because the market had dropped so far. So if you're not willing to go through that, that's okay. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. What I'm saying is it's a bad thing if you write the loan and then make that decision, right? If you're not willing to foreclose, don't do the loan. If the loan goes into to default, act immediately. There's no benefit of waiting. I understand there's lots of scenarios and lots of financial hard times that people fall on. But I am not here to suggest that I'm completely heartless and I don't have a heart for the people that fall into tough financial times. However, I also understand that the majority right, of the time, people aren't, their situation isn't going to get better based on the terms of the deal, especially in a loan situation, if you've loaned money to someone and they miss a payment, right, I want to know right away why. And if they miss another payment, another payment, it doesn't take long to realize they're in a hole they're not getting out of. And the time to act is immediately. So when they miss their first payment, you need to be on them. Hey, what happened? And it doesn't mean that you're heartless. If you think there's a genuine story, no problem. When can I expect payment made? And if they make it, move on. If they don't, take the next step. And if they don't the following month, take the next step, right? The quicker you move, the easier the process will be. Again, only if things go wrong. If everything goes right, there are no issues. <clears throat> we, we do not require this, so I want to make it clear this is not a requirement. This is just something, again, we've seen collect interest monthly. I know a lot of people want to write, a lot of borrowers try to push for balloon payments. I'll pay you at the end. I'll pay you at the end. That is certainly up to you if you choose to. I would never do that personally. And the reason is I don't know if it's in trouble if I'm not getting payments. So if I write a loan that's a rehab loan and I'm going to get paid when the deal is done, I have to wait from today, the day I loan the money, to whenever the rehab is done to know if everything's in good order. And that, to me, I don't like. I don't need to collect a large payment. I may just need an interest payment. But I need something each month that says, hey, you haven't forgot that you have this loan due. Um, if you're unsure about a loan, hire a professional. The first probably five to ten loans that I did, I had an actual mortgage broker that reviewed them all. Assisted fully with the process, up with the borrower, underwrote the whole deal. And they got paid. I made less money, but you know what? I made good loans. 
So part of the reason I've never had to default on a loan is because I've never written a loan unless I was 100% certain about what I was doing. And there was a long period of time where I wasn't, but I could hire a professional that was. Hire professionals, appraisers, hire professional inspectors, lenders. If you don't know how to underwrite, find someone that does and pay them a fee, a consulting fee, a loan fee, an origination fee, whatever it is, make sure that you're getting a loan that is quality because that's the value here is quality. Number seven, title insurance. We do not require this. We cannot require this. We will have you sign a waiver. I see this all the time, right? There was a loan that I personally was involved in. Set everything off. The attorney that was doing the deal called me and said, hey, there's two liens on this property. Had we not gone through the process and gotten title insurance, we would have never known, would have never been reviewed. So if somebody is telling you, loan me the money, I just bought this, I don't need title insurance, you never know, right? This was someone who bought this property at a sheriff sale and it had two liens on it. Now, were they resolved? Yes, but they may not have been. You won't know that unless you do title search and get title insurance. Right? And here's the beauty. You as the lender don't pay for it. And if your borrower is telling you that they can't pay for it, if a borrower can't, if the borrower can't come with a few hundred bucks to ensure a good title policy is on it, I would worry about what kind of borrower am I lending to? If this deal is so tight that they can't afford to be protected themselves with title insurance and they're not willing to protect me, the lender, with title insurance, I want nothing to do with it. Not saying you can't do it, but if you're going to do it, make sure it's risk adjusted. Right? Because it's something that can go wrong that people simply don't even realize can go wrong. Um, hazard insurance. This is another big one. Verify that hazard insurance is in place. I require, if I have a loan that goes over a year, all of my borrowers are required to send me proof of title or proof of um, payment of their hazard insurance. So if they buy it in January, I set a note for January of next year. That borrower owes me a clear indication that hazard insurance has been paid. Because if they don't pay it and they try to save a buck and the house burns down two weeks later, I have no insurance. If they have a loan on this house, their money's not tied up, mine is. Right? And I never want that to happen. So always verify hazard insurance. Right? Property taxes. It's another one. Make sure property taxes are being paid. You could be lining up with a lot of these bills because. Your, your borrower says, I'm just not going to pay my taxes. And if this deal goes sideways and so the market shifts a little bit and they walk away, you could end up with a property that could need more rehab because you gave them money ahead of time. It could be at risk for not having insurance or title insurance. And it could certainly be at risk of having liens from a property appraiser uh, because you haven't paid property taxes. So the nice thing is you don't even have to have your borrower validate this. Just go online and look yourself. You can go right onto a county's website and see that. And then personal guarantees. I love them. Some people don't care about them. I like them. You can always get personal guarantees from anyone that you need to to validate that loan. So if there's a couple people buying a property or they've got partners, I want the, the person with the best credit to guarantee the loan. Right? I have no problem loaning money to an LLC or to an entity, but I still want a personal guarantee of someone inside there. These are all items that don't necessarily, they're not requirements. They're just things that we've seen on deals that have either gone bad or along the years that have, these are ways to ensure that, again, whether you buy a note or whether you create the note, you need to make sure that you're protecting yourself. Looks like another question has come in, so let me get that addressed. It says, if you buy a loan, does the existing title insurance transfer to you? So when you buy a note, the, trans the, the policy, and, and let, me, let me go back. I, don't, I am not a title insurance expert, so I want to give that caveat. And I apologize. I started to, to answer it as if my answer was 100% um, fact. But... Depending on how long the note has gone on, whether you get insurance or not, 
it's only insured up to the point that the title insurance was done. What's transpired after the fact is not insured. So if somebody has, if somebody, if somebody wrote a note and you can see the policy, right, title insurance policy, and it was written January 1st, 2018. From January 18th and prior, right, that title company has said there are no liens encumbering this property and we insure that, right? So yes, you have a stamp where title insurance is up to. But if I buy that today, January of 2020, two years have transpired. So if I go in and I buy that note from somebody, I don't know what's been added to the property since. Title insurance isn't a forever thing. They're not going to go look at it all the time. So you may want to ensure that a new title policy is, is written. Because again, you could be inheriting a property. It's a very good question. It has an issue. Now, it would depend on how long the property's been owned, right? Or how long that note's been in existence or how, how old the date is of the original title policy as to whether or not you'd want to move forward with that. But yeah, I'd want to know that if I'm buying a loan on a property that, that may have some major issues that are recent, I could be inheriting this. So you want to make sure that you're not. Um, and the only real way to do that is to go out and get a title policy. Definitely something to make sure that you're evaluating and a very good um, question to ask. Um, any other questions come in? I think we're good there. So let me pause because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring us down the home stretch here. So if you have questions um, or you have, uh, you know, comments or anything, please get those typed in now. What we try to do is we try to help people understand the how of private notes, some of the what and why. Um, if you're looking on how to physically buy, right, there's lots of great people out in the, the marketplace that can help you with that. They can talk to you about how to underwrite. They can talk to you about what terms, what types of loans, the value of non-performing notes, you know, versus performing notes. There's a lot of education. What we want to make sure is that you understand how notes work in an IRA. They do fit. They fit nicely, and they can fit chunked up between multiple IRAs, and you can originate or you can buy existing. Either one, we have clients that do all of the above. So with that said, uh, let me get us taken down the end. So the cost, here's the beauty. This can all be passed on. $50 to open up an account, which we do waive for people that join our, our um, webinar today. Um, the $95 to issue a loan, $295 a year to hold it. So if I'm gonna write a one-year loan to a borrower, I'm gonna charge them $295.95 as fees for that loan. You can add to that, but I always have borrower pay, pay the fees because again, he who has the goal makes the rules. Um, so what does it take? It's pretty simple um, to get started. It takes about 10, 15 minutes to fill out the application. Um, one thing to make sure that you understand is there is a seven day rescission period in IRAs. That means that this is based on Congress and IRS's rules. You have seven days to take your IRA back. Wherever you open it, you can say, I didn't want to do that, I'll take it back. Obviously due to the nature of the investments that you make here, we cannot put an investment inside your account for seven days. So if you want to write a loan to someone and you want to act quickly, make sure you open your account and start the seven-day rescission period. Otherwise, if you come to us today with money in hand and say, I want to open the account with this money and loan it to this person tomorrow, we're not going to be able to do that because of that seven-day rescission period. Right? Um, the other purpose of being a client is all of our educational content. Um, we do a lot of this today, which is we don't charge for. We want people to, be, uh, to get smarter and, and uh, learn more about self-direction. But we do host quarterly events and client-only education, and obviously all of that uh, requires you to be a client. Um, and the cost of weight is you're missing out on opportunities. So we'd love to help you guys get started um, with self-direction. The next step is to simply fill out the paperwork, get money over, um, transfer it over to us, depending on where that money sits, uh, and then determine who and what uh, you want to invest with or into. So I will pause for a minute or two for questions here. And uh, if we've got any, um, all right, uh, it says, uh, somebody asked about uh, previous webinars. Um, yes, if you want to get our previous webinars, if you go to newviewtrust.com, 
Oh, let me make up this next slide has it here. Give me a second. If you go to new, oh, if, I'll go back. If you go to newviewtrust.com and uh, click under the blog section, all of our webinars are, are added there as blog posts. So you can go back and search and look up any of those. Um, the individual asking the question referenced um, UBIT and UDFI as a class. Um, we've got probably 30 or 40 different webinars on all different topics there. Uh, so please definitely do take a look. Uh, if you want to receive our e-guide, uh, you can text IRA guide to 484848. Uh, it will ask you for a couple things and then it will uh, send over the guide to you. Um, question is, it said uh, asking about mixing um, the uh, missing the first part of the webinar. Yes, this is recorded and it'll be on our blog probably in the next uh, couple of days. Um, but you can go onto the blog. It may even be sent out to all of the attendees as well. Um, um, I'll, I'll answer this question the way it's asked. But, but whomever asked it, if you want to, if I if I miss what you're looking for, please ask it again. It says, um, where are a few places that you look to be able to buy terms on a note? Um, so I think what you're saying is like, where, where can you go to find notes? Um, if that's not the question, please um, ask me. So I'll give you a couple different places. Um, you can go online, or I'll start with live places. So um, as far as looking for notes, um, I, I attend a lot of real estate investment associations. So uh, depending on what geographic area you, uh, everybody on here may reside in, uh, if you go to National RIA, um, it's the National Association of Real Estate Real Estate Investor Associations. Um, you can find chapters in your area, any sort of real estate investment club. Everybody there, there's a lot of people there that are that are doing private deals with a lot of real estate loans. Uh, some to be written, some that are existing. So I've done both. I've bought existing notes and uh, and, and generated or originated load notes through that. Um, there's a, also a lot of online communities, um, like Lending Club, obviously, is kind of a big peer-to-peer -peer group. Um, you can take a look there. Um, that's a lot different than, than, you know, kind of what we talked about today, but there's a lot of loans there. Um, there's some local groups. There's a group that has sponsored some of our events called Paperstack um, that, uh, that is a marketplace for uh, private notes. Um, but it doesn't take long of, of using the Internet or going out to these live events where real estate investors are. Um, regardless of how you, you know, choose to, I always recommend do your due diligence, understand what you're buying, um, especially for stuff online, because you, know, you wanna make sure that, that you're in, in a good sound position and not buying something that may be worthless. All right, I think we got them all. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to having you on our future webinars, but thank you very much. Take care.